Hey everyone, it's Phil Hall of Westfair Communications. Thanks for joining us for this week's video, and I'm very pleased to have as my guest Val Wright. She is the author of the new book, Rapid Growth Done Right. And we're discussing a subject that uh, doesn't get discussed a lot in business media, and that's what happens when you get the boot from your company for whatever reason. And Val, I guess my first question would be a rather broad question. If you're fired from your job, is that something for you to be ashamed of? Absolutely not. It is one of the most common, worst kept secrets that exists. So many people have been fired or it doesn't even have to be fired. It could be like pushed out to the point where you have no choice but to resign. And when you start talking about this, you'd be surprised how many other people reciprocate with a story where they've had something similar happen to them. Mm -hmm. I know there's no particular data on determining who gets fired or for what, but what, what are the most common reasons for business professionals uh, to be shown the door? Uh, that you mean the official version or the unofficial version? Because the unofficial version is you don't get on with your boss and you don't get on with your peers. <laughs> and there can be lots of made up reasons or created reasons why that happens. But you, you, many people know what it's like when you're in a company and everything is clicking and people just get you and you can walk into someone's office and you can tell them what they think without worrying about like any repercussions and there's that level of candor and that kind of what I call it symbiotic relationship that happens now when that doesn't exist something needs to change and um, that sometimes results in you know someone being hired above you um, you know, your responsibilities may be taken away from you, um, or you've been told that, you know, the company's going in a different direction, it's time for you to move on or take a different job. Yeah. I think probably the most famous heave-ho in the history of corporate America was Steve Jobs uh, at Apple, but that was interesting because he came back years later. Is, is that the exception to the rule, or are you aware of executives who've been shown the door and uh, some time later get a phone call saying, you know, maybe we were a bit hasty. Um, I think that maybe happens more often than we know, but people don't accept that request to come back and, you know, fix the things that we knew you needed to fix back then. So um, what, what I see happen is when people are fired or uh, part ways amicably or secretively is uh, the story doesn't often come out until much later. And, uh, you know, what I see happen is, you know, many people do the ostrich, right? They bury their, they bury their head in the sand and they're like, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want anyone to know that I'm not working there anymore. You know, I'll go into complete, like, bury my head in the sand. And that's the very moment you need to not be doing that. You need to be out there talking to people. I mean, it's why, you know, when I added that chapter in my book, um, I let everyone just talk anonymously because the stories that people share, um, you know, when they know that their name or their company isn't attached to it, uh, you get to learn a lot of lessons from that. And I wanted people who've, you know, been pushed out or, you know, and it could happen right now with, you know, you've been selected for furlough or your job's uh, been made redundant or you've been laid off. Um, and you, you can deconstruct what happens so you can learn some lessons for what you might do next time. Uh, but also it helps you choose what company you might go to because you learn some things of like, I never want to work for a boss like that again, or I never want to work for a company like this, or, okay, now if I'd only asked this question at the interview, I'd have realized that, you know, the level of empowerment I thought I had, the decisions I thought I could make, make I actually can't. I know in the pre-internet days, and I'm old enough to remember the pre-internet days, if somebody got fired and, uh, don't tell anybody, but I was one of those who did get fired, I would just basically, call my friends and say, hey, guess what? Uh, I'm not working there anymore and go look for another job. Of course, today we have social media and we have people who don't know when to stop talking on social media. If, if you get fired from your job, is it a good idea to go onto Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and say, I got fired and then even go the extra mile and start bad mouthing your former employer? Um, if you don't want to work in that industry again, <laughs> sure, go ahead. <laughs> like, and, and, you know, and some people say, like, I'm done. Like, I'm done. I'm going to set up my own business. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to, you know, move to Hawaii and open a surf shack. And, and, and in that case, it's completely fine. But the reality is most of us cannot, do not have the means to be able to do that. And so there, there is a reputation issue there. And, and so, you know, what I talk to people about when they've been fired is find a close circle 
of confidence who you can let rip with and vent and share um, and then quickly find people who are going to help you discover what's next. Should you be uh, cognizant of what you're saying in your corporate emails uh, ahead of the potential firing? Uh, I mention this because I was uh, working for a company. I actually had left the job uh, because it was making me physically ill. And uh, what I discovered afterwards is that uh, when I left, they actually went through some of my old emails and they found some messaging that I had made about them that uh, wasn't particularly flattering. So. Uh, should you basically be keeping the, the personal opinions out of the, the corporate emails? Yeah, I, I mean, I think whether you're getting fired or not, absolutely. Like you have to assume anything that you write on company property um, and, you know, sometimes in company time, even if it's, you know, your Twitter account and you're being public about it, um, you, you shouldn't write anything down that you don't want your com company to, to see. Um, and then um, in the era of what I call the, magnifying glass and the microscope you know everyone's watching you you know everyone everybody is you know you can have an outburst in a restaurant and someone might have videoed you you could be talking about your boss on a train or a plane and the person next to you could be a reporter and and i think you and by the end of the flight someone could have tweeted your whole conversation which has happened and people have got fired because of what they say on a plane and so um we have to be far more conscious now this isn't let's pick up tomorrow's newspaper and see what's been written. It's uh, 10 minutes after we've said it, you've gone viral when maybe you didn't want to. I'm reminded of that uh, news story from, uh, I think it was last month in New York Central Park where a woman filed a false police report. She, she felt that uh, somebody was harassing her and it was all captured on uh, cell phone video. And she was quickly identified and her company saw this and uh, gave her the boot. For that, uh, a lot of people in the U.S. are under the impression, well, I'm protected by the First Amendment and I can say anything I want, but that's really not how the First Amendment works. I, I mean, you, you are responsible for the reputation of your company. And uh, there are certain things that you can say and there are certain things that it's not appropriate to say. You know, whether it's legal or not, it's like, do you, do you want to be known for uh that opinion or that statement or that behavior and and in the era of everybody has a cell phone and everything's getting uploaded um you have to you have to really think through um is is this a memory that i want out on the internet and and i think the the, the it, really thinking through you know i talk about the virtual you and the real you um, you know, I say to people like, you know, if you were to, if you were to Google someone, what's out there on them? And do you want that being the top of the first page of your Google search? When you were writing your new book, what were some of the more surprising things that you've come across? What surprised me was just how willing people were to share stories of, um, success but failure as well and so you know be, being publicly vulnerable isn't something that comes naturally to everyone so what surprised me was when really incredibly successful people said hey I screwed up here or you know I, I made a mistake or I could have done this differently and I would love that to become more of a trend that people were able to share a mistake but then not be publicly vilified or not be you know fired because they made a mistake but we learn how you know you learn from what you did what you did wrong and you um talk about it in a way that helps people realize that oh i can screw up and i can talk about it and we can learn from it and then we can grow and you know companies that create that culture of yes it's okay to talk about your failures um you know amazon has this leadership principle and it's called being vocally self-critical and jeff bezos actually wrote the description it's you don't believe your own body odor smells of perfume mm -hmm. because you know very often you know in big companies you have this overinflated view of yourself and you know what amazon tries to instill is that you talk about your mistakes you talk about what you're not good at and so what surprised me was just how willing everyone was to share some of those things you know, well, having this conversation, I'm remembering something I hadn't thought of in a very long time, and 
uh, that was a television show that President Trump had before he became president, The Apprentice, which sort of turned firing into entertainment. Uh, did a program like, like that maybe trivialize uh, or perhaps dilute the severity that uh, traditionally comes a across uh, in losing one's job? I, I think reality TV shows always show the drama and the entertainment. Mm -hmm. And what I always like to believe is that it should be okay to get fired. It should be okay to say, you know what, this is not a fit. Um, and it, I, it may have trivialized it and it certainly created, you know, entertainment. Mm -hmm. But how much of that, how much, and, and I actually know some executives who went on that show as judges and I know how much of that was scripted and it was <laughs> less, it was less of a reality show. It was more of a script show. Okay, you say this, you say that, now you stand over there. Now, now let's retake that and let's spontaneously create this by, you know, take three. So, you know, I'm a little cynical about reality TV shows, but, um, what I do believe is that it's, it's a chance for people to uh, tell their story in a different way um, and be okay saying, yeah, you know, I did get fired or yeah, I did get pushed out. Um, and here's, here's what I learned from it. Yeah. Well, of course, Donald Trump uh, had his trademark just basically being this sort of uh, gruff monosyllabic executive who was just saying, you're fired. Uh, what are some of the, uh, the better ways, the more diplomatic ways for uh, an executive to tell somebody that their services are no longer welcomed? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I would love it if there were never any surprises. Mm -hmm. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise to you you're being fired unless you did something ridiculous that you should not have done, um, that you didn't think you'd get caught about. But um, I would like to believe that if you could allow for no surprises, that there is a pre-warning if you like there's you know and i have these five stages in the chapter of my book that kind of talks about the five stages of getting fired or pushed out um and so i would love it if there was like this pre-warning of hey here's our expectations you're not meeting our expectations there these are the three things that you need to do to meet our expectations and you've got 30 days to prove or 60 days to prove um how how you can turn that around um, and then when the conversation comes 30 or 60 days later, it isn't a surprise. And so, you know, rather than the dramatic, you're fired that you get um, on a reality TV show, um, it's more of a, we talked about this, here was the goalpost, you missed the goalpost, let's part ways. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, protocol of ridding oneself of an employee different in the US versus Europe or other countries? Yeah, it's it's different in virtually every country worldwide. And in some countries, it's more complex. Um, in some countries, there is um, a time horizon. There are processes to go through. There are unions to negotiate with. Um, so it does vary around the world, yes. I'm reminded of a story I had heard about uh, Howard Hughes when he was running the RKO studio in Hollywood. And apparently, Hughes didn't like to fire people. So what he would do because he was Howard Hughes and he had all that money, would be to hire another executive and put that person in a position above the person he wanted to get rid of. So the person that uh, he really wanted to give the boot to, all of a sudden saw his uh, power diminish to the point that he was just being a rubber stamp. Now, of course, Howard Hughes was one of the richest men in the world and could afford to bring people on staff like that. But is that something that is common in corporate America? Yeah, it's more common than you'd think. Um, it, su it surprises me why people don't have more direct conversations. You know, I, I regularly talk to executives, um, you know, and I'll, I'll say to them, you know, uh, tell me what you're trying to do with your business in two years time. And, and then the question I always like to ask is, if you were to time travel your current team to the future in three years time, could they run that business? The size and scale it's going to be in three years, not today. And then they often sit there and like, scratch their head and think and go, yeah, maybe not. And um, people don't always think about how do I grow my business to the future by hiring people that could run bigger businesses. And what I would love more people to do is be way more direct in terms of saying, you know, you don't, you haven't been hitting the mark and we're going to hire this other person because they've got these three experiences that you don't. So do you want to work for them? Do you want to work alongside them? Or is it time for us to part ways? 
Well, you were obviously working on this book prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has seen so many furloughs and so many people laid off. In your opinion, how did corporate America handle this situation with the furloughing and with laying off people? Oh, it was, I mean, it's been polar opposite. I mean, some companies have done a really brilliant job and then other companies honestly have been a disaster. Um, and it, it's less about what business decisions am I making? You know, how do we, protect, of course you want to make sure that you protect your cash flow and you make sure that you're still liquid and you can still pay payroll. But the way in which you communicate is all within your control. So if you have to lay off people, how you tell them, how you communicate with them. You know, we've heard these stories about how, you know, 200 people have been laid off via Zoom. Um, and, you know, Bird, the electronic scooter company, did a terrible job of, you know, announcing to people on Zoom and then immediately cutting off everyone's email access um, in a very impersonal way. Um, and, and then you hear of other other companies, you know, there's a department store retailer in uh, in England, um, House of Fraser, uh, they're part of a group where they didn't have to pay all of their employees furloughed, but they topped up all of their employees and made sure they got paid throughout April um, and May. And, and so there are decisions you can make if you've got the cash flow to do it, but how you communicate these messages has been polar opposite in terms of, and when someone's on furlough, uh, they're still your employee. Now you can't ask them to work, but you can still talk to them and update them. Um, and so what companies who have done a good job of communicating will um, reap the benefit of is um, knowing that they've been treating their, their employees well, because it's all very well having like a poster on the wall saying, employees are our most important asset. We're not <laughs> going to talk to you or we're going to mess up your pay in some way that's really significant while you're on furlough or... And, and so actions are far more important than words or a glossy poster on the wall. How common is it for people who have been let go from their jobs to take the former employers to court? Um, I, I think we will see a flurry of uh, legal companies um, taking advantage, shall we say, of the current situation. And some of those cases will be just and some of those cases will not um but what i i'm seeing a different trend i am seeing people who are on furlough saying you know what i'm now going to evaluate what else is out there and i'm going to use this time to say you know is my value um more value is, is my personal worth more valuable to a different company than my own company and so what we're going to see a trend of is uh, companies are going to invite their furloughed employees back and they're going to go you know what no thanks i found somebody else who values me more. <laughs> wow. Uh, so for people who are going to be picking up the new book, what are going to be the key takeaways that uh, they will gain from it? You can learn how to evaluate how you influence others. And you can learn different ways of communicating. Um, we are all, and I'm staring at this rectangle as I have been for a long period of time, as I'm sure you and all of your listeners have. Oh, yeah. um, and it's brutal. It's brutal. I mean, who, who would ever stare at a mirror of themselves for like eight hours a day? And that's effectively what we're doing. Like, you know, you, I can see myself. I'm trying to, did I put my bookcase right? You know, do I look tired today? I mean, that's so unnatural. And so what we have to do and what you learn from the book is you learn different ways to communicate. You learn different ways to talk to people. You learn different ways to build relationships. And when you are sat in front of a square screen with, you know, dogs and kids wondering if they're going to come in the door or not, uh, you, you, need, you need to find different, different approaches. And so you'll learn different ways to communicate. And then there is a chapter in there about the, the getting fired, but there's also a chapter in there about how to define and find your perfect job. And um, I would love to click my fingers now and everyone who's miserable in their job, like let them go get a different job where they're not miserable. Um, and that's what that chapter does. Wow, that's great. What kind of feedback have you gotten for the book? I believe it, uh, it was released in May. So it's been out that's on right. the market for a few weeks now. That's right. Yes. Well, it's hit a few bestsellers, which uh, always keeps my publisher happy. Um, and um, it's a nice way to get some um, extra marketing. And what people have been telling me is that they have, you know, I've, I've, I've had people who've called me and said, hey, I've got a new job now. I followed the toolkit in your book and, 
you know, I've, I've been able to get a job that's making me happy. You know, I've, I've had people say, hey, we found a new way to create new ideas, Val. And um, we've, we've learned new ways to think about how we innovate, even if we are all sat on our computer screens. So um, I'm getting some good Amazon reviews. I'm getting, uh, I did this unboxing campaign. Um, you know, for those your listeners who have kids will know that it's a thing that kids have a box. I don't have a box in my office, so I can't open one now. But, and they video themselves opening a box and go, wow, it's a toy. That's a thing. Like there are YouTubers who make millions of dollars <laughs> boxes. And then there are loads of kids that watch videos of other kids opening boxes, unboxing do the hashtag, you'll find it out. So what I did is because all the bookstores are closed and I'm launching a book, so how do I sell a book? Is I sent books to uh, lots of my executives and they did their own unboxing videos. So if you go on my Twitter account or my LinkedIn feed, you'll see people unboxing with the beautiful ribbon, my, my book. And so um, I've been getting feedback in unusual ways as well. I, 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 I swear, I've never heard of unboxing before this conversation <laughs> and it's like yeah I, I feel like uh i feel like i came out of the 19th century it's just so much is happening yeah. that i was not privy to <laughs> i know well i i apologize now because you will go you will lose at least 30 minutes on a rat hole in youtube looking at unboxing videos and find a kid that makes seven million dollars a year from his unboxing youtube channel because it's real well, I, I hope the viewers of this video uh, don't turn it off until it's over before they go looking for the <laughs> unboxing video. But uh, what's next on the agenda for you, Val? What's your next book going to be? Yeah, it, it is called The um, Rosetta Stone for CEOs. So the Rosetta Stone is the translation of hieroglyphics that the um, Egyptians created so that you could understand um all of the carvings and what my next book is about is this is this translation layer it's for it's the code for ceos and business leaders um for how to create what i call a truth-telling company it's how you remove the insulation layer around you it's how you communicate effectively to your investors your your shareholders your board um how you manage performance um so it's the translation guide for ceos Excellent. Well, Val Wright, your new book is Rapid Growth Done Right. Congratulations on its success. And thank you for being on today's video with us. It was lovely talking to you, Phil. Very good. And folks, we'll see you next week. Now go take a look at those unboxing videos. I'm going to be doing <laughs> the same thing. Take care.